Open our Bibles to Luke chapter 22. We're going to begin in verse 24, a story you probably know. A few in the room may not have heard it, and don't feel bad about that. Your eyes can be opened to this in an amazing way. For those of us who know this story, I hope we're patient. I hope we understand that our theme today is heavy. It's fail. And before I begin and, and set the tone, I want to remind all of us that we have a short and small group time. So when we're dismissed, uh, please remember to be back here uh, in your assigned areas by 11. Uh, no later than 11 so we can see a film that's going to speak to our theme of fail. From the time you were born, failure has horrified you. It's human nature. When you have children someday, and I hope you do, when you have children someday, it's horrifying as a parent to realize that your kids expect to be perfect at everything they do from the moment they start. Both of my sons are amazing young men. I'm proud of both of them for different reasons, but I'm really grateful to be their dad. But it's horrifying, and I mean that word specifically. It's horrifying for me to realize that they think that every time they try something they've never done before, they should be great. Nothing you ever do in life that's ever going to be counted as majestic, as perfect, as great, as superior, nothing you ever do won't come without hard work, won't come without effort. Your mom and your dad can't be your success. They can't protect you from the one thing every human being has a PhD in, failure. And failure ought to hurt. Failure ought to be one of those things that we look back on and we think, I wish that hadn't happened. But here's what you need to know. You can't stop it from happening. Being a disciple of Jesus will actually be full of more failure than it will success. There will be more losses than there will be victories. Uh, please understand, for the rest of your life, you will learn more in a loss than you ever will in a win. When you get a paper back in school and you needed a B and you got 79 instead of 80, there's a part of you that wonders, how could I have gotten one more point? What did I miss? You'll look through the paper to find out how I could have bettered myself. One simple point to get the grade I wanted. If you got an 84, you throw the paper away. I accomplished my goal and may have learned nothing. I want you to know that failure can be the most wonderful thing to happen to you, or it can be the downward spiral toward absolute rejection and loss of your soul. It simply comes down to what you do with it. Luke twenty two twenty four. Luke tells us, and a dispute arose among them, the disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Here's the context of what's going to take place between Jesus and Peter. And please remember to see Jesus photobombing Peter. We're focused on Peter, but behind him, you'll always see Jesus doing a work that sometimes Peter doesn't see. And if we miss that this week, we may glorify Peter and miss the point. They're arguing about who's the greatest. And after Jesus corrects them that none of them are qualified to even be considered for that, something happens between him and Peter specifically. Do you know that your sin is predicated on one of two things, your fear or your pride? When our fear sets us against Jesus, we will experience our greatest most horrifying failures. When our pride sets us up against Jesus, then we will experience our greatest and most horrific failures. Every sin you and I commit comes down to one of two things. We're either scared to trust him or we think we know better than him. Peter exhibited both of those. Yesterday morning, Peter was fearful that Jesus wasn't enough and he went underwater. Today, we're gonna see proud Peter who feels like he knows better than Jesus. And so they're having an argument about who's greatest and Jesus just simply tells them that if you wanna be greatest in my kingdom, you serve. You don't take control. You don't set your dominion. You don't reign over people. You simply serve them because proving yourself isn't a part of the kingdom of heaven. 
Because on our very best of day, we're not that much. In verse 31, Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, now I want you to pause for a moment. He's renamed him Peter, right? You heard about that last night. He called him the rock. And upon this confession of this one called the rock, he's going to build his church. When you go to the Holy Land one day, and, and you may, when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to realize that every building that's been standing for a thousand years was built on a rock, not on dirt, not on sand, but on something that wasn't going to be moved. But he calls him here, Simon. He's telling him, I want you to become Peter, but you're choosing to be the guy who always has to be in charge, the one who's always making his own way. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked, now I want you to notice this, this may not fit your theology, but let me introduce it to you. I don't believe there's anything Satan can do that God doesn't give him permission to do. That'll mess with you. When you suffer, when you get sick, when someone you love dies, when there's a tragedy in your life, we often like to blame this fictitious Satan. But I want to tell you that the temptations in this world and the struggles you and I go through and even some of our failures, God is more cool with it than we are. Satan has asked you to sift you as wheat. Satan is going to try you, Peter. Excuse me, Simon. He's going to take your pride and he's going to use it against you because he wants to destroy you with it. Job is the story of what happens when Satan tests us and it brings our worst fears to mind. This is a story of a man who thought he had it all. He could protect Jesus and he couldn't even protect himself. He says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Simon replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, I want you to pause there for a moment. I want you to see that in your text. It's very important for us to get the context of this. Peter corrects Jesus. And Jesus says to him, no, I tell you. And when Jesus tells us something, it's true. It's right. It's appropriate. It will last the test of time. He said, not one word I speak will ever be proven false. Not one truth I tell you will ever be undercut by the science of the day or the logic of the day or the theology of the day. He said, no, listen to me. I tell you, Peter. Oh, he switched the name, didn't he? You see, if you spend some time slowly going through the Bible, things are going to pop up that make you happy, make your tail wag. If you rush through the Bible to do a five-minute devotional, you're going to think you see and see nothing. He says, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Jump down to verse 54. Jesus goes to the, the garden and he's arrested. Judas betrays him. He's arrested. And something funny happens. At least I think it's funny. My wife rolls her eyes when I tell this story, but it's in the Bible and it just makes me happy. I'm still a junior high kid at heart. They come to get Jesus the Roman soldiers arrive, and, and Jesus steps forward. After Judas kisses him, Jesus says to the Roman soldiers, who do you seek? And they say, we're after Jesus who came from the town of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I'm who you're looking for. And the Bible records that all the Roman soldiers fell down on the ground expecting that he was going to kill them. And the cool thing is, he could have. I don't know how cool your Jesus is, but mine's got a little hair on his chest. And they said, who are you looking for? He said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I'm it. And they're like, we're dead. And they fell down. And Jesus, he's an amazing man. He looks at him and he goes, no, no, get up and do what you're supposed to do. Who do you want? Do you want Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I'm him. But don't harm anybody else. You came for me. Take me and leave the others. He's always protecting us. Even in his worst moment, instead of worrying how great he was perceived to be like Peter was, Jesus chose to protect the disciples. And they take him captive, and here comes Peter. I don't know where he got a sword, and whoever gave Peter a sword, it's a bad idea. <laughs> Peter pulls out a sword and goes, wah, and he goes right for a dude's head. He's going to kill a Roman who will crush him. And the guy moves his head just in time, and his name's Malchus, and his ear falls off. Now, we all look at that and go, that's kind of funny. No, have you ever banged your ear really hard? All the nerve endings in there? 
You football players, you know what it is when you get ear holed. It's not really that your head got moved. It's that your ear got pinched, and that's one of the worst. It's like stubbing your toe. I don't know why that's a major pain, but it's a pain. All those nerve endings. Malchus grabs his head, and he screams, and Jesus looks at Peter and goes, Dude, I can protect myself. You don't need to protect me. He reaches down. He pulls the ear off. He puts it back on. He heals it completely, and everyone's like, Cool, we good, we good, and then they leave. Can you imagine Malchus goes home and his wife goes, what's on your shirt? Oh, I got, uh, I got nothing. <laughs> he looks at Peter and he said, Peter, I got 10,000 angels waiting for my command to come down here and take names. I got this. You see, Peter is a good man. His mistake is that he's trying to protect Jesus instead of understanding that the only way he lives is that Jesus protects him. And Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before morning. And Peter says, hey, everyone else around here is chicken. I'm not. I'm the man. I am going to protect you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to. You need me, Jesus. What he didn't understand was if Jesus would have let Peter do what Peter was trying to do, you and I would all go to hell. Have you thought about that? Sometimes we try to rescue Jesus instead of understanding that what Jesus is allowing us to go through is to show his power in the failure, in the storm, rather than our strength. Remember, we're not here to study Peter's life. We're to study how Jesus works in a man's life. Jesus said to him, I prayed for you, Peter, because your pride and your fear are going to keep you from living the life I want you to live. So he said, when you fail, I pray that your faith would never fail. Now, but I want you to notice something here. Jesus never said to Peter, I've prayed that you won't fail. Jesus never said to Peter, I, I, I prayed that you'll be successful. I prayed that you'll be cool. I prayed that you'll be famous. I prayed that you'll be appreciated. Jesus said, no, what I pray is this. When you fail and you will, that you will fall on your faith instead of your failure. Here's what we need to walk out of here this morning with. What happens when you're not enough? What happens when you try your best and your best is average? What happens when you wake up one day and you can't believe you did what you did last night? It's not who you want to be. It's not what you were called to be. What happens on those days that we fail, that we tried, we had the best intentions or we had horrible intentions? It doesn't matter. Failure is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. A disciple will not be perfect at following Christ, but if they rely on their faith and who he is rather than who we are, we can follow him to death. Because I want to give Peter some love this morning. Peter didn't run away when he failed. He just wept. You see, continuing on, go down to verse 54 then again. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him to the house of the high priest, and Peter followed at a distance. Everyone else is gone. Peter's there. And when they'd kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down, Peter sat down with them, and a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him, and she said, this man was with him. Remember, this is the same guy who just a little bit earlier was wondering, if everyone knew how great he was, if everyone appreciated how much Peter had accomplished. And now someone says, hey, you're that guy that hung with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else said, you are one of them. Man, I'm not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Oh, my goodness. What an indelible failure. Do you think for the rest of his life, every time a rooster crowed, Peter cringed? Do you think there wasn't a moment every morning when he, hit the, when he heard the rooster awake in the day, he didn't stop and think, I cannot believe I did this. What if I told you that Jesus knows you're going to fail and he loved you anyway? Jesus isn't amused by our good efforts. 
he's excited about our faith. And sometimes the greatest act of faith you and I will ever exhibit is after we've failed, after we've blown it, after we've lost the things we most need, when people don't think we're all that, or people don't have as much respect for us anymore, or we've hurt someone we love, and we turn around, and for most of us, we walk away. The first time most of us would have failed Jesus at this level, we would have walked away and said, I can't do this. And if you say, following Jesus, I can't do this, you're ready to be a disciple. If you're thinking for a moment, I put a rock in that cylinder last night, and now I'm going to show that I'm serious. Stop. Repent. Here's what you need to do. I put a rock in there, and I need his help. I need him to save me in every circumstances I'm in. When he tells me the truth, I need to not fear. When he tells me the truth, I need to not correct him. From the time we were children, whether somebody taught us this or not, failing was not an option. And I'm going to tell you today that you will fail as a disciple of Jesus. But discipleship happens after you've failed. What do you do then? Jesus said, I've prayed not that you'll have a good life, a comfortable life, a popular life, a successful life. I don't call you to follow me so that you can change the world. He said, I ask you to follow me so that you'll trust me, even if I put you in a storm, even if I allow you to fail, even if I take all of your man-made dreams or your woman-filled dreams and I strip them from you. If you know that I'm enough, if you trust that I'm enough, you'll even let me go to the cross and die. And by doing so, you'll realize that through the death of the cross, Jesus took, he traded places with us. His success became my success, and my failure went on him. Jesus is not nearly as worried about your perfection as you are. The question of the morning, and it'll go for the rest of your life, is, do you trust Jesus with every win, and do you trust Jesus in every loss? Because if you do, you'll learn what Peter learned. This is what Peter would write later in his ministry, 1 Peter 1, 6. Just listen. Close your eyes and listen. Listen to what this man, who every time the rooster crowed, was reminded he wasn't enough. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Rejoice in your salvation to come. And the glory that will be yours when you see Christ, even if need be, You'll be going through heaviness because of your many failures. We don't need to save Jesus. We just need to always return to the Jesus who saves us. And then you're never a failure. You're always redeemed. You're always chosen. You're always valued. And you'll always be saved. You're dismissed.